with shocking images of war, asking the right questions. Who's sharing this video? Have any of these shots been published before? Finding the details hiding in plain sight. You'll see that the tree has shrapnel uh, marks on it. The work of verifying facts in the online flood. The hospital blast in Gaza this week was captured on video and shared in real time, but not all of it was real. Adrian Arsenault went to CBC News video verifications team to reveal their approach. So, Yvonne and Rachel, thank you for being with us. You do the lion's share of verification of a lot of the video that comes comes your way. Before it goes on the air, it, it goes to you first. So I'm wondering if we could talk about the hospital and how you have been able to verify some of what you've seen, including this footage that uh, of something on fire that people initially said was a hospital. Oh. Yvonne, how did you know what it was and where? Well, thanks to certain tools that the are open source that everybody can use. We can uh, determine whether something happened uh, in a specific place and in specific time. So for the, the exact video for, of, of the hospital, we basically gather all the footage that we can mm -hmm. and we start analyzing them. Every point in the world is specific due to you know, all the, the buildings or features that around them are. So a uh, hospital has these uh, solar panels, solar panels mm -hmm. that are used for energy. And you can see this like very specifically shaped solar panel above the building. It's, mm -hmm. it's sort on, of tilted. Yeah, it's on the angle. Yeah. And when you compare that to satellite imagery, which is on Google Earth Pro, uh, you can see the same shape of that uh, solar panel right here. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it's kind of tilted, uh, just like the one on the video. And when you uh, compare all these other solar panels, you, you, you have one here, one here, and you have a parking lot right here with mm -hmm. some trees and buildings around, mm -hmm. you can see the same kind of organization right here. And you can be pretty sure that whoever shot this video was actually in this building here. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. It's a pretty dark video, but, but you, you brighten it as much as yeah, you physically yeah. can. So you saw the solar panels and stuff. Rachel, what, what else did you see? in that video. Um, so the timing of when the video came out was really key for me. So I was seeing the news about the, uh, about the bombing and then this video was popping up on uh, different channels that I had been following that had been proving to be pretty reliable. So I was able to get in touch with one person in Israel who was able to tell me he found this from someone that he trusts and he saw it pop up within a few minutes. So what I was doing was taking screen captures from the video and trying to run it through Google reverse image or tin eye to see have any of these shots been published before the bombing? Because that would suggest that it would have been fake. So I just want to play another video here. This was shot by Al Jazeera. This was a live stream. That appears to be a rocket heading into the sky. You saw this video. What did you do with it? We see one explosion, then another. Uh, you can basically see the same structures you can see right. the same uh, solar panel here. You can see the panel here. You can just see, see, see it there. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the tree right. that's uh, right here. And, and this was the day after. So people were uh, started filming what happened the, the aftermath of the attack. There's the tree. Mm -hmm. So this sort of verification only gets you so far. It only establishes, yes, this is the location of the hospital. This is the time it was taken. That is accurate. That is an accurate reflection of what it looked like on the ground. That picture is real. You can go with it. But that's when the journalism kicks in to try to I interpret what is happening right there with that rocket in the sky. Is that connected exactly. to that explosion? Exactly. And that's where we need the help of experts military experts. I know we've been talking to some. We need that expertise to tell us what that trajectory looks like, um, but our verification can only go so far. Verification has layers. This is layer one. Layer two would be, how do you interpret what you see? Giancarlo Fiorella is a visual forensic researcher with the investigative group Bellingcat. So what exactly uh, are we looking at here? So that is a montage from a video that was shared from the parking lot of the hospital 
the morning after the explosion. What we're able to see there is a crater from the munition that caused um, these fatalities um, and injuries at the hospital. You say a crater. Were you able to determine if it was the only crater? We haven't seen any other craters in any of the other videos that we've been able to find from uh, this incident. And the damage that we see at the site um, is consistent with this being the only crater, the only uh, explosion that took place here. In terms of information analysis, what does the size of that crater, the nature of that crater, suggest to you about the munition that created it? Well, we uh, conducted a preliminary analysis on this uh, video and others that we found. And uh, we got an expert comment from uh, somebody who pointed out that uh, the crater is not consistent with a larger munition type, uh, what are called JDAMs. So those are the bombs that you would typically expect uh, the Israeli military to use. Now, that doesn't in itself mean that this was not an Israeli munition. Uh, we're still in the process of verifying who was responsible for this, but the size of the crater is not the size that you would expect from a larger uh, bomb. Which is not to say that the Israelis don't have smaller munitions. Exactly. We're trying to determine not just using an analysis of the crater, but also uh, other hints that we could pick up from um, open sources on the internet to try to determine conclusively what type of munition this was and doing that could help to determine who was responsible for this. What we see there also uh, is uh, the damage that that area uh, received. Um, in that video, there's a tree and you can see a branch of it in the screenshot there. And uh, just a few frames after the screenshot, you'll see that the tree has shrapnel uh, marks on it. So um, this tree is uh, located some distance away from the crater. And based on the relationship between where the tree is located and the crater, we can draw a cone of shrapnel that this um, munition essentially sprayed when it exploded. So there's obviously a lot more work to be done. Um, what do you need as investigators to get your hands on or to see, to make a determination in terms of who fired this and, and what it was that was fired? So we've spent the whole day uh, looking at every single video that we've been able to find uh, from this incident. And we're looking specifically for anything that could be a munition remnant. That is a piece of this explosive device, this bomb, this rocket that would have remained at the site um, after the explosion. And so we're looking for them because if we can determine um, that an image contains a munition remnant, we may be able to determine precisely what type of missile or bomb that came from, and that would help us to um, point the direction one way or the other as to who would have been the owner of that missile or that bomb. For people who are watching at home who are often curious and questioning about the validity of, of what veracity of what it is they see, do you have any tips for them? I would suggest that people really sort of slow down their consumption and take the time to ask critical questions. Who's sharing this video? Uh, is this person a reliable source of information? What makes me think that? Do they work with a particular organization or not? So just slow down your social media consumption and ask critical questions about what it is that you're looking at. We're still learning more from the video of that hospital blast and other incidents. The work of our colleagues verifying those images will continue to inform our journalism. Coming up, she spent a lifetime studying the natural world and she has a message for the world right now. If we carry on like this, we will be doomed, but we've got this window of time. Matt Galloway's interview with Jane Goodall is next. Jane Goodall understands our link to nature, and she sees trouble. We really are in very dark times. At 89, she has few illusions. Because we can be truly evil. But the main message from the iconic anthropologist... We must work together. ...is one of passion and hope. CBC Radio's Matt Galloway sat down with Jane Goodall to talk about her belief that we can meet humanity's challenges. The world feels like the axis has been tilted a little bit and the news isn't good. How are you doing right now, given everything that's happening around us in the world? Well, 
we really are in very dark times. I've lived nearly 90 years on this planet, and I lived through World War II when Britain stood alone against the might of Nazi Germany, and there was no hope for us, and yet we managed. Do you remember those days really vividly? I remember very vividly towards the end of the war when I was 10. <clears throat> I remember with, still with that same feeling of horror, learning about the Holocaust. And just, I remember climbing the same favorite tree where I read Tarzan and thinking about human evil because we can be truly evil. You know, chimps go to war, chimps kill, but it's the passion of the moment. It's responding to an outside, um, <clears throat> like seeing a stranger from another community. But we can sit far away from conflict and in cold blood plan how to kill as many people as possible, how to torture people. And that's evil. But it is environmentally, politically, and socially really bad, bad times. And this latest uh, Israel-Hamas war that's terrible. Let me ask you about the environmental issue. I mean, the summer that we have been through has been apocalyptic. You have towns burning down in Hawaii. You have wildfires and the smoke that spreads all over the world. The hottest temperatures on record in certain areas. Um, Flooding coming, and hurricanes. And then it goes on and on and on. Yeah. Coming through that, um, what goes through your mind about, about the world around us in some way? Well, you know, as far as the environment goes, everyone is focused now on climate change. But, you know, just as important as climate change and inextricably linked to it is loss of biodiversity. Mm. And, you know, as habitats get destroyed and ecosystems collapse, that's doomed for us if we don't do something about it. Where do you put, not the blame in some ways, but where do, you, where do you put the responsibility for that? Who do you pin that on? Well, the responsibility, obviously, some of the big companies burning fossil fuel, the oil and gas, um, corruption, and unfortunately, a lot of governments get corrupted by money, by big business. And so, but there's also all of us, each one of us, we could do our bit to protect the environment. And so many people, you know, they feel helpless, hopeless, so they do nothing, mm -hmm. and they carry on with business as usual. Do you understand that? Do you understand that, that sense of being overwhelmed, that people think this problem is intractable? That is exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's why if our young people have that attitude, well, we're doomed because they are the future. The thing is that we've got to work with them to try and at least slow down climate change and loss of biodiversity. Maybe you can help. And I began our youth program, Roots and Shoots, way back in 1991. And it's growing really fast across Canada, which is wonderful. It's got young people from preschool through university, even adults now, and working with the indigenous people who understand the land so well and have protected it until we come along and take it away from them. Hmm. What's most alarming to you about the biodiversity loss that we're seeing right now? You know, the ecosystem is made up of this complex mix of plant and animal species, and you find that each one has a role to play. And so if you think of it as like a beautiful living tapestry, every time a species goes from that particular ecosystem, it's like pulling a thread from the tapestry. So if enough threads are pulled, the tapestry hangs in tatters, the ecosystem collapses. And if we carry on like this, we will be doomed, but we've got this window of time and we have to get together. You talk about hope a lot and, and hope is an elusive thing for a lot of people right now. And I just wonder when you hear people who might say that it's too late, that, that we've already passed this tipping point, um, what do you say to them? Do you understand where they're coming from? <clears throat> yes, well, a lot of scientists are saying that. Mm. And um, David Suzuki said that to me. He said, it's too late. And I'm not alone among scientists to believe there's this window of time when we can at least slow it down, start slowing it down, 
start saving the forests, and there is a much greater awareness. So I try and convince them by telling stories, telling stories about, you know, I've seen places totally destroyed, like Sudbury. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the stories in the latest IMAX film. That it's a mining town that was a moonscape and that you're there helping people to plant trees that's and right. regrow a forest. I always give my tree a little kiss because I want to get the tree energy and I want the energy from the tree. So they, they began that I call, about 30 years ago and everybody said it's impossible, you never clean up the rivers and the lakes, fish will never live here again. And lo and behold, it's a lush green place, uh, loons on the lakes and fish coming back. Do you put much hope in, in leaders, in, in elected representatives to figure out a way forward? Well, you do get passionate people in government, but so often they're, they're overruled. And, you know, that's one big problem. You can have a president who really cares about the environment, puts lots of um, protections in place, and then the next president comes along and undoes them. I mean, that's what happened in the U.S. Are you confident that we'll figure out how to work together? That we'll figure out how to not be selfish in some ways? Well, so the good news, if we look at it as this tunnel yeah. of problems that we have to overcome, the good news, there's groups of people working on every problem. But the, but the, the trouble is they're working in silos. And if they're working without thinking of the whole picture, in other words, collaboration, we must work together. Yeah. And young people are good at that. You said that in some ways it feels like you're put on this planet to do this job. And I just wonder at the, at the end of our conversation, you're 89 years old. How do you find the energy and the drive in the midst of everything that we were talking about to still be out there, giving people hope in the face of hope? Hopelessness. It is news, yeah. yeah. Well, um, First of all, I, I'm, I'm driven because I care passionately about, about the environment, the forest, the animals. While I was in Sudbury, I was invited to plant the 10 millionth tree. I care passionately about children. You know, I've got three grandchildren. They're grown now, but they'll presumably, two of them anyway, will probably have children. And what a world to be born into. Well, it means that I'm, I'm not ever going to give up. <laughs> The film she was referring to is called Jane Goodall, Reasons for Hope, released this spring. It highlights Sudbury, Ontario's re-greening program. Coming up, a furry burglar with a taste for Italian cuisine. When I got home, I called the cops and they almost didn't believe me. The bear, the break-in and the lasagna that was just right. It's next in our moment. A homeowner in Connecticut was in for quite a shock last week when she checked her security camera and saw this bear going through her freezer. When the bear got what it wanted, it ambled off with its ill-gotten gains. What was on the menu? Deep dish, deep freeze, pasta. The lasagna-loving thief is our moment. I got a message on my phone saying that somebody was in my kitchen. I went on my camera to check and there was a bear in my kitchen. <laughs> He just walks over to the freezer like he's done it a million times, pulls the drawers open, and pulls a frozen lasagna out of the freezer and goes away. <laughs> so my mother's lasagna is by far the best lasagna I've ever had. We started selling at our restaurant, you know, to go. And I think that it's so good that even, you know, the bears heard about it and they just had to break in and take some as well. <laughs> when I got home, I called the cops and they almost didn't believe me. We definitely have a bear problem because the same bear that was here last Wednesday, she was back going to the same window to do the exact same thing just a couple of days later. There were so many things in that freezer, he could have taken anything, and he went straight for the lasagna that I really wanted. It, it was like he purposely walked in the house to get the frozen lasagna from our restaurant. <laughs> So a few things come to mind. First of all, they do lock the doors. Now they're going to start locking the windows. That's the first thing. Second thing is, as smart as the bear is, I wonder how it's going to feel about the aluminum foil that the uh, pasta comes in. I don't know if we'll get an update on that. And, you know, this is Connecticut, but there have been a lot of bear sightings in Canada, BC, a record number in August. 
And we actually have a, a national crew out in the field right now doing a less whimsical story about bears that will be on the national soon. That is the program for October 20th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night, right here for The National. Have a great Saturday.